electricity. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it. And if you live through it, you might wish you hadn't. Ask a lineman about it. Um, it's my pleasure to get to introduce John Ball. His credentials are extensive. He's got a PhD, he's a CTSP. He's done anything and everything possible in the industry, training, um, climbing, um, working on his campus trees and everything. There's probably many, many more things that I could say. I think you'll learn more from John than you will from me. So please welcome John Ball. And if you don't know him before, you will after. Thank you. Uh, my guess is everybody can hear me, right? Is that a yes? All right, good. Because my problem is sometimes people can hear me in the next building. So anyway, uh, we'll go with that. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. A little bit warmer here than it is in South Dakota, not by a lot, but nevertheless, I'm enjoying it. I don't see a lot of snow out here, so I'm pretty happy to be here today. And what a lead into the presentation. This is just about perfect. Uh, so I really appreciate what they uh, just did here today. Looks like we're having a little difficulties here, but let's see if we can get this thing rolling. There we go. A little bit on me. Well, at South Dakota State University, where I'm a professor of forestry, it's my latest gig. Uh, that I teach the arboriculture classes, no, uh, no surprise there. Uh, my students have to work outside. And I did that because for a long time, I used to work doing tree work, I used to manage companies. And I remember hiring a kid one day and uh, he comes in and uh, later on in the week, he, I said, all right, we're heading out. And he says, well, my professor said we wouldn't have to work in the rain. Oh yeah, well, we do here. And so it's kind of nice to get them out. And if they don't like the working conditions, maybe you want to find another major. Better learn it then than after they graduate. And by the way, most of them just thrive in that work environment. Um, I'm also a campus arborist. So I do the climbing and trimming and all that sort of stuff and drive the trucks and all that. I've got the CDL, so I have to drive everything everywhere for the crews and that. And uh, this was one of my fun jobs. Uh, Gary will like this one if he's around still, but because uh, he mentioned fraternities. Uh, that's a big spruce tree on a Saturday. I'm sitting in my office on a Saturday, and it was just after a huge windstorm, and I got this message, John, you got to come down to the edge of campus. Well, sure, why not? That tree was struck by lightning all the way to the ground. We have right at that time gusts of 20 miles an hour. In two more hours, it's gonna go sustain 45 to 50. I've got two hours to get that thing on the ground before it takes out that building. And it's our homecoming. So to the cheers of a huge crowd of drunken college students, we managed to drop that tree in that time period, but it was fun. I also teach a rock climbing class, kind of all fits. It's my favorite class. Reason why is if you don't listen to me, you die. You know, what a better thing for students. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, I don't really care if I pass this test. Oh, this one, you really do care, <laughs> all right? And by the way, they have a lot of fun. That's our final, you got to summit Devil's Tower. Uh, the rappels off it are incredible. Uh, it's still, in order to get an A, you have to shake my hand on top of Devil's Tower is, uh, you know, I'm kind of Gary's age. I think I'm older than Gary. Uh, but I know one of these days it's going to become, well, you know, in order to get an A, you have to carry me up to Devil's Tower. But right now, I can still do it. And then I also teach the EMT classes at SDSU. I am an advanced EMT. I do work it. And, that, and you'll all get a kick out of this. For the advanced EMT classes, every one of the students has to do 10 sticks. In other words, they have to, on a real person, that's a fake arm right there. But on a real person, they have to set 10 IVs and get the fluid going. Well, that means I got to find kids that are willing to be guinea pigs. Well, my Arbo students that aren't doing well on exams, you know, I say, if you want bonus points, and believe me, some of them, we could drain them of blood. They need that many bonus points. You can come in in the evening. Now, by the way, this is not for the timid, because remember, you've got your arm out there. You've got a student that's never done it before in a live human being. And so I'm staying over and going, no, 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 you insert it. No, a little too deep. No, pull it back out. No, it's a little bleeding. You got to go. And you're listing that the whole time. Occasionally a student faints. That's good for me. <laughs> oh, and you got to love my office. Because I'm in with the, with the health group. And so let's say mom and dad come because they want little Jimmy or little Susie or little somebody to become an arborist. 
They come up to my office on the third floor. There's my office. We push all the cadaver carts right down my hallway. That looks good, doesn't it? Yeah, I want to be an harvest. Look at all the dead people lined up already. By the way, when I'm in my office at two in the morning and I hear some strange knocking, it really freaks me out. <laughs> all right, well, let's get into it. Let's start out with the big scheme. Then we're going to work our way down. The big scheme is in the United States today, we have four fatalities per 100,000 people if we lump everybody working, all right? Take everybody working in the United States, we're going to put you in a big pool. The fatality rate is four per 100,000. What that means is you want a job that's lower than that. Now, you don't have that. The lowest one I found was a college administrator. It was less than one. And what I found remarkable, daycare providers have a higher fatality rate than college administrators. Apparently, small kids are brutal. <laughs> Now, trucking's one of the biggest. It's about the seventh highest, and it's at 27. So remember that number. Police and fire at about 20. Hey, Gary, there's your butterfly picture uh, where the guy's out there doing this. This is a, oh, by you'll love this. This is a government project, which means you have one supervisor for every worker. That's why you have one person watching. And he's out there butterflying that and destroying a perfectly good silky saw for of no value, as you heard from Gary, but it was one of those old practices we used to do. But if we take everybody in this pool, everybody in the green industry, a landscape architect, a uh, golf course superintendent, a tree worker, we're all in one big pool, we have a fatality rate of 13 per 100,000. That's what, three to four to three times higher than the national average. That's not good, is it? But now let's pull just the arborist out. Just take the group that's out there caring for trees. Okay. And we jump to 60. 60. If you're doing tree work, are you crazy? <laughs> Can't you find something else? I'm sure there's a college administrator job somewhere in the state you could apply for it. But it's 60 per 100,000. Now, it's not at the top. Top end is always uh, forestry, as you might expect. Logging is a very high-risk profession, along with commercial fisheries. There are always one and two. And they run at about 120, to give you an idea. All right, so they are the highest risk in this country. But keep this in mind. And by the way, if you're, if you're offended because I'm calling us tree trimmers and pruners, that's how OSHA describes us. So that's my use of that term. But again, 60 per 100,000, you're in a high risk job. I think you know that, but if you don't, I hope you appreciate it. And one thing our customers don't appreciate is the fact that they're paying us for the risk as well. When you're out there trimming a six, you're up there in an 80 foot cottonwood, they're not just paying you for your time. They're paying you for the risk that you're running. And I don't think we should forget that. Well, we've got a lot of issues out there, and one of them is power lines, which is what I'm asked to talk about here today after that great demonstration. I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of hot dogs destroyed over the years. It's a great little demonstration. I think it drives home a number of the points that I'll make here. But uh, if you've ever seen the sword, and from that, the sword here, uh, Demikas, where what he had is the sword, what he wanted, he was on the court for the king. And he was always buttering up the king. King, you got a great job, wonderful job. Wish I could be a king. King says, okay, we'll train. He's sitting down. People are feeding him food, waving him, all that sort of stuff. He's liking this. I'm a king. And then he looks up, and a sword is being held by a single hair. And the point of that was is the king is always under danger. Danger, in this case, from above. And that's you. That's that power line, ever-present danger. Now, we do have communities out there that have gone and put everything underground. I happen to live in one, Brookings, South Dakota. But most communities, what do you have? You have trees and you have power lines. It's an ever-present danger. So let me give you an example. I promise you no gore pictures. We have 80 people at home watching it, and gore does not translate well on a small screen in, at your home. Uh, but this is an actual example. The pictures are not from this, obviously, but this is an actual event. 
A climber is working approximately two feet from a 4.2 kV line, single phase, okay? One of the lower end of distribution voltages, All right? He contacted the line through his pruner, causing him to catch on fire. What did you just see here today? Fire. One of the things that you don't really think about, but let me give you a tip. What are you wearing when you're trimming your trees? I know we like to use a lot of synthetics. It gets hot. Synthetics melt. There's a lot of parts of your skin. You don't want somebody pulling out that debris. Cotton is your friend. Fire and rescue waited for the power to be disconnected, then accessed and lowered the climber. That's one thing people keep forgetting. We're not going to do anything until the scene is safe. First thing I'm teaching my students is, is the scene safe? You don't enter something until the scene is safe. Somebody in a power line is not a safe scene. We're going to wait until there's a disconnect. Now, I'm going to tell you this, which may surprise some of you, because when I started in the 70s, it was like, oh, we got to get you down in four minutes. No, throw out the four-minute rule. We killed a lot of people on a four-minute rule, All right? If you're not instantly killed by that contact, you're going to be alive 20 minutes later, generally speaking. You're going to be suffering severe burns, as Brian was mentioning, and hopefully you passed out so you're not feeling that pain. But don't think everything has to be a rush, and we're not going to rush. When you take a look at fatalities in this industry, if I have double fatalities, in other words, one incident, two people died, it's one of two things usually. Either it was a driving incident or it was electrical contact and someone tried, attempted to save an already dead person. Consider that. And we're going to wait. Anyway, they accessed and lowered the climber after the power kill. There's the run report with everything uh, blocked out, of course, that's pertinent. All right. And then he's in. And Brian said it best. Well, if you survive, and maybe that's not a good thing. I think it's always a good thing, but you're not going to be in a lot of good state here. An emergency fasciotomy was performed over both forearms. You know what that is? You're swelling from the inside because of all the internal burns, and your arms are going to act as tourniquets, so you got to slit them. That doesn't sound very pleasant. Then the other problem we're going to have is completed a 24-hour Parkland regiment contained on force alkali diuresis for three days. You know why? All that tissue, burn tissue, your body can't process and clean. We're going to blow out your kidneys. So we got to run fluid through you so you don't have a kidney failure. I bet you never thought of a kidney failure from doing tree work. And then he underwent three days of multiple debridements. Why? All that damaged tissue and clothing and all the burned material. These are not pleasant. These are not pleasant at all. And sometimes you die a month, a week, a year later. And one other thing that surprises people is, I'll bet you never thought of electrical contact as being one of the more common reasons you're amputated. In other words, the arm or hand or foot is burned so badly, it has to be removed. Now, about 1,000 people a year suffer uh, electrocution. Now, by the way, that's everybody. That's not just tree workers, thank goodness. But in high voltage, we really define as anything above 1 kV. And they were talking about about 7 kV over here uh, on the primaries. And uh, let's see if we can get this thing. It just isn't happy unless I point in that direction. There's about uh, 138 million visits to hospital emergency departments in the year, all right, in the past decade. And I've analyzed all the reports late at night. I'm sitting in there going, okay, let's get on the computer, click research, and I'm going to go through all the banks. Take a look what happened. About 80, uh, 98,000 involved electrical contact. So in other words, you survived. You went to the emergency department. And this is everybody, of course. Uh, to give you a comparison, there's 280,000 visits involving chainsaws. Uh, I wrote an article for TCI Magazine on chainsaw injuries among homeowners. And you ought to read it. Hand it to your customers. This is why you're hiring me. When I become king of the United States, I don't care what firearms you hand, but I'm going to ban the ownership of chainsaws unless you're a professional. And I'll save a lot of lives because people are crazy, as I'm sure you all know. 
And a reminder on terms, this is an important one. When someone says someone was electrocuted, they're dead. They died from electrical shock. You don't survive an electrocution. When someone says, yeah, one of our workers was electrocuted a few years ago, but he seems to be doing fine now. Where? All right, where? Where is he? All right, and electrical shock is a physiological reaction to the passage of electrical current, and I italicize that word to note it, through the human body. Brian said, this isn't pleasant. As you saw here, this isn't pleasant. It's the internal burns that we're worried about. Now, the problem you have is your skin actually has fairly high dielectric properties. And once you come in contact with electrical current, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but merely transformed. So guess what? We're going to thermal, and then I'm going to burn through your skin, and now you're very conductive. And so we have massive burn. Uh, FYI, if you report so one of your workers contacted a conductor and he's alive, we'll make the run, but we're not bringing him to the local hospital. He's going to go to a trauma unit. For us, that's 250 miles away. All right, this isn't something. So when you call someone for 911, they contacted a power line. Okay, now we know we got internal burns. Now we know we got something that's out of the box of tricks at the local hospital, perhaps. This requires special care. Well, now I got your attention. They got your attention. Are you worried about electrical shock? Oh my gosh, John, you, you got me convinced. Don't go in the house. All right, stay out of the house because that's where most of them happen. If you want to reduce electrical shock injuries, here's the three groups of people you want to help. What I call the explorers, the daredevils, and the do-it-yourselfers. The explorers are toddlers. They're the most. They stick things in everything. They eat everything. And so they're a big reason people show up in the emergency room. And then teenagers, you're all daredevils at that point. And one that surprised me when I went through the data, okay, you're all a teenager. I want you to think back for a minute, get in that happy place. Why do you think you would suffer electrical shock? I mean, yeah, doing something stupid, but doing something normal. What would you suffer electrical shock for? What were you doing? Plugging in your charger. Yeah. All right. They're cell phone users. I'm trying to convince my daughter. No, you don't need a cell phone. You could die. It's, it's not working very well. <laughs> all right. And then the adults are all do it yourself. Or sure, I'm pretty sure I can wire this myself. And guess what? They go out and trim trees. The other thing I'm going to ban when I become king is metal pole pruners. Because they push them up into the, uh, in the tree and they end up touching the wire because they think that's all insulation. And they did mention on service wires, we can have insulation. Insulation can wear, right? Never trust it, never touch it. People say, well, I see squirrels running on it. You're not a squirrel, <laughs> all right? And then four words that should never be used in the same sentence, power line rental lift. I mean, my gosh, I went out, this is in South Dakota. I'm looking at it going, yeah, this is not good. So I wanted to look at the homeowner tree crew out there. And it was really cool. This is right by Halloween. So there was a ground crew already killed, apparently. All right. Uh, there we think. But look at this guy. A tree with a wire through it, single phase wire, big silver maple, and he's in a metal basket on a rental lift with a metal pole saw. You're, you're essentially asking to be elected. So what do we have? And, and again, in all seriousness, it's those toddlers. Uh, they're, they're more than half or about half of all the ED visits uh, that come in, meaning they survived and they will survive, but they have some burns. And then we have the teens and plugging into outlets, cell, uh, cell phone chargers, and a number of other things as well. I'm just mentioning a few. And then uh, for the adults, it's working on the dryer, the washer, something like that without isolating them. And then car batteries. And what I think was interesting is look at the number. Look how many homeowners go in because they were trimming trees and touched the wire. And they got to the emergency room and it probably wasn't pleasant. Homeowners should not be trimming trees. How about for us? Well, electricians, no surprise there for an occupation are ones that have the most. Fatal. These are fatal now. But take a look at arborists. 
the numbers go anywhere from 5 to 10 percent. 5 to 10 percent of all the fatalities. And guess what? That's disproportional to the number of tree trimmers out there. That means this is one of your highest risks. This is your sword. So when we take a look at it, we've got a lot of hazards. Falls from trees or lifts, struck by falling trees or branches, contact with a current caught in, struck bys and all this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the other ones, but I do want to mention them, keep it in proportions. But you know what? I don't, how many climbers do I have here? Very many. All right. If, you have, if you're not climbing, don't start. All right. Yeah, you're asking to be injured. Oh, no, by the way, I'm still a climber. I like it. Uh, but nevertheless, we've had a lot of issues and we don't have time to go into them with climbing techniques and that, but we have seen an uptick in these. The other, though, is falls from aerial lifts. And guess what you're doing? You're overreaching and you don't have your fall protection attached. By the way, another one is you fall off the cab from the cab protector. I don't know if any companies do this. It is not a requirement. But I'm finding more and more companies, the only way you can enter and exit the bucket is from the ground. They will not allow their crews to be up on the cap protector because that is a trip hazard. It's not going to kill you, but you're going to end up with lost days. And so now it is, okay, we're going to put it on the ground. You enter and exit from the ground. Again, it's not a mandatory requirement, but I think it's a darn good idea. All right, the other one struck by a falling tree or branch. Oh, I'm like Gary. Give me something and let me punch numbers. Has anyone ever seen this, the 5, 15, 90 rule? 90% uh, of fatalities occur within five seats of the base tree. It takes 15 seconds for a tree to fall. That's just aching for someone to study it. So I go, huh, I don't know. Let me get some data together. So we drop trees. Okay, it's not. In fact, I've come up with a new rule, the 520 rule. It's one less number to memorize. You'll like that. All right, where do I get the 520 rule? It takes about five seconds for a tree to fall. Depends on the hinge, but about five seconds. And in five seconds, you can walk 20 feet away from the tree, seriously. And most fatalities do occur within 10 feet. So try to follow the 520 rule. When that tree starts to lift, shut off the saw, start walking, you can be 20 feet away. And remember, only one person can be up next to the tree, nobody else within one and a half times the tree helicopter. And that's the person holding the pole line, everybody else two times. Struck by a falling branch, again, we get a lot of those because you're not using the communication system. And then, of course, we get all these. Uh, you know, when you take a look at chainsaw fatalities, you're, if you die, you're in the air. That's where most of them happen. You bleed out before anybody can get to you. And you know what you were doing? You were one hand in the chainsaw. Don't one hand chainsaws. You're not allowed to do that. I know people here probably do. I know you can probably find a picture where I did it once or twice or a half a dozen times in the old days. Uh, but I, seriously, a lot of arborists die doing that. We don't want to see that. Chippers. Yeah, we get a lot of incidents with that. Uh, I'm going to go into electrical now, but I wrote an article on rental chippers. You should read it. It's not pleasant. Anyone can give me the age of the youngest person that went into a chipper? Two. Literally, the parents sat them on the infeed, handed a twig to take a picture of that selfie moment, and the kid went in. And that, that's why homeowners shouldn't be running chippers or stump grinders or anything tough. And stay out of traffic, please. Your mom told you that. All right. Well, now we're into the electrical. Look at that. 15% of them. Why? Because with trees and wires are common combinations. And we have three groups of arborists that are working out there. We have the unqualified arborists. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean you're not an ISA certified arborist. That doesn't mean you're not a board certified master arborist. The unqualified refers only to electrical, okay? And then we have the incidental line clearance arborist. That's probably a lot of people in this room. That's someone who has training and experience, but they're working for a homeowner or municipality. The wire is incidental to their work. They're not there to create space around the conductor on behalf of the utility. They're there because they're trimming a tree. And then the third group there, the qualified line clearance arborists. Those are the people with training experience that their sole purpose of being in that tree is create space around that wire on behalf of the utility. And if you say, John, I'm scared to death of electricity, what group should I work for? The last group. They have the lowest fatality rate. They work around it every day. 
They know how to do it safely. By the way, we do have a Z standard, and how ironic. The reason we do have a Z, the reason the Z started, was because of this young man's death. He was just working. Look at that if you can read it. 4.8 kV wire. Touched it and died. His mother, as any mother would be, was distraught that her son died in an industry that was completely unregulated. And so she started the Z. And our Z predates OSHA. And it all started because someone was electrocuted. So when I go through my numbers here, if someone's paying you and you're working on woody plants, you're an arborist, okay? Just so you know. So you might say, but John, I'm a land uh, that was a landscaper. I don't care. They were getting paid money and they're working on a woody plant, all right? Electricity doesn't care. So I'm working with a fairly big box here today. And so here's our unqualified arborist. This would be landscapers, ground keepers, lawn care providers, tree workers, any with, without training and experience that's working around overhead power lines, okay? That's a lot of people, isn't it? And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with these people. They just don't have the training, so they should not. Nothing wrong in this. And then that incidental, residential, commercial, municipal that have the training, and they can work near the conductors. And then, of course, the line clearance arborists whose sole purpose is being there. So there's our three groups there. And they all have different standards. So what standard applies to you? Let me go through the box here. First diamond, is any part of the tree or brush being worked on within 10 feet radial to electrical supply lines or communication lines? If no, then anybody can trim that tree. But if yes, now the next decision box is, oh, are you working for the utility or not? If no, Subpart S applies and you're an incidental. If you are working for the utility, then all of 1910-269 applies, you're a qualified line clearance service. So those are the boxes. That's the chart you all have to follow. What group am I in? What am I doing? Where is the tree in relationship to my work? I like this one. Now in South Dakota, I am the tree guy, as they call it. The one person you call if you got tree questions or problems. A tree company called me up. They're 400 miles from my office and say, hey, Dr. Ball, could you come out and look at this tree for us? The power line, the power company won't come out and help us. Well, sure. So I jump in the truck and I go. But, you know, I'm making other stops too. But it's a big space. I put a lot of drive time in. But I still got a CD player. So Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin, I'm on all the time. But I get out there. This is the actual tree. And they called the utility. The utility wouldn't come out and take the line down for them. Why not? Because those are comm lines. Those aren't power lines. Okay. And so they said, oh, they're, all, they're eight feet away. Oh, we can do the work. I said, no, you can't. How come they couldn't do the work? No, those are comm wires. Because they don't even know what they are. That means you're unqualified, right? And you can't be within 10 feet of anything. If you don't know what all those things are up there and what they do and what a transformer is and a service drop and all that and what they can do, all right? You have to know all that. And you have to know how to work safely around them. And so what I say, if you can't identify any dark line in the sky, you're unqualified. You can't get close to it. And here's my best way of driving it home. Am I permitted to work anywhere in this tree if I'm not qualified by training experience? In other words, I'm an unqualified electrically arborist. You do not have the documented training and experience. Notice my word documented. It doesn't mean you sat down one day and plugged in a toaster. So now you have training, all right? Documented training, you've taken a class, all right? Am I permitted to work anywhere in this tree if I'm not qualified? Well, you folks tell me. Now, by the way, let me set this up a little bit more. If you look at that tree, the primary is within six feet of one of the branches. So can I be anywhere in that tree? No, very good, thank you. No, if any part of the tree is within 10 feet, any part of the tree, you can't be in it. That's a hard thing to get across to people. And there's good reasons for this. They already told you a couple of them. You don't wanna be in that path, do you? And what happens if you're over in the other end and you drop a branch that swings over and touches the wire? I've seen that. I've served on those cases. So if you're unqualified, guess what? 
You can't touch that tree. That's why you're calling them. That's why you're calling another tree company that is qualified. That's where you say, I'm sorry, sir, ma'am, we can't do this work, but I know a tree company that can. Or no, I'll have to call the utility. They'll have to shave off everything within 10 feet, and then I can do the work. There's ways around it, but the one way is not doing it. And if you really want to look at it, and they drove the point home, is OSHA says the longest conductive object, and guess what? OSHA considers a tree a conductive object, just like the folks here did. All right. And here's what happens when you don't. I blocked out the spots here, but this was a trimmer. He was up there trimming the skirt, cut a frond, was holding the frond, reached out, touched the wire, was electrocuted had no training or experience. Was working for a tree care landscape company, does a lot of this work, but died. And no documented training or experience. The fine to that company, and who cares what the fine is, a guy's dead. But the fine's 120 some thousand dollars. And by the way, when OSHA shows up, they're gonna go through everything. Oh, guess what? A guard was off one of their chippers. Uh, excuse me, stump grinders. Okay, that's another 12,000. They just go right through it, and they should, right? Don't let untrained people work around conductors. The unqualified still have some requirements, by the way. Their requirement is they got to look and make sure there's no conductors there. You know what? That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to do a hazard assessment and job briefing, and I hope everybody here does that on every job every time. Now, that is a big change from 50 years ago where he just showed up at the job and he started working. Now we're supposed to take a look at the site, see what the hazards are, and then have a job briefing. Because you know what often happens is nobody knows there was a wire there until they hear that zap, until they see the hot dog that's a person flash. And then a common thing from the crew is we didn't know a power line was there. If you just did this, that would save a lot of lives. Do that inspection, do that, and look at this. All right, crew comes out, hey, these look like electrical and communication lines. They don't know which are which, they don't know the order, all they know is there are dark lines in the sky, and they're unqualified. Hey, and they're within 10 feet of the tree, so we're not pruning that one. You know, there's companies out there that specifically do not want to be qualified. They tell their salespeople, do not bid jobs where there's conductors within 10 feet. Just don't do it. There's enough jobs out there. We don't need those jobs. We don't need that risk. And you know what? I like that. I'm not saying you all have to do that, but I'm saying, you know what? That's a path some companies do. We just want to write ourselves out of that 15% of the fatality group. You're going out and selling a job. If you find a tree that like this, you would say, sorry, sir, ma'am. We can't do that work, but we know another good tree company that'll do it for you. And you've got a good relationship with that company. So you know they're not going to start poaching your other customers. They're just going to come out and do this job. You know, don't put yourself at risk unless you have the training. Well, what incidents has occurred to the unqualified? Again, unqualified electrical. Well, this pole saws. All right, they get a pole saw and they push it up there and they touch the wire. All right. It's amazing how many pole saw, metal pole saws get used in trays or gas powered pole saws get used in trays, All right? No dielectric properties. They're gonna energize you, read them. In fact, we ought to just put a big warning on it. Don't even put this within a mile of a power line. I'd be happy with it. We actually look, could we ban the manufacture and sale of metal pole pruners? We couldn't, but it'd save a lot of lives if we did. And of course, what are they also doing? They're out here in a metal pole saw using one of these that says right on it, you know, stay away 10 feet. Nope, we're gonna rent one and we'll go out and finish that job. Or this, I won't mention the town this tree company's in, but it's not New Mexico, so we'll be safe there. All right, but yeah, do you think that has any dielectric properties? I think not. And again, we all started small. We all started with crappy equipment, so I'm not making fun of the person that owns it. All right, hate to see some of the stuff we ran back in 1970. But the fact is, you wouldn't want to push that anywhere near a wire at all. And people do it because 
gee, it's electricity. I don't see it. I don't smell it. But it's that sword hanging by a single thread. You know, we do have them with dielectric properties, but they're not using the insulator for us. In fact, what a lot of landscape companies do, they rent one when they need it. We've seen an uptick in the last 20 years of landscapers being electrocuted, doing tree work. Why? Because now they have the means to get up 40 feet near the conductors. They can go out and rent something on a job that they're also doing other work on. Well, how about pruning from the ground? Because notice I referred to pruning from the air. Well, pruning from the ground is a little different, and it should be, because if you have that small tree in somebody's yard and it's within 10 feet, of a service wire, you're saying, my gosh, I can't stay under the ground and prune some branches off. You certainly may. Okay, they're not saying that. But in those, you still can't come closer than 10 feet to any wire with any tool that you have. And that makes sense. And watch the ladders in that too. We've had it where you're moving a ladder and you touch the wire to it. Oh, and someone should ask me this. Well, ball, this is all BS. He says, if I followed that, I couldn't even walk into their yard to give them a bid. Look at this. If I'm not qualified, how do I walk in there? It's nine feet from the ground. I think my head's going to be within that. Okay, you all know the answer. Well, sir, ma'am, you're not in an elevated position. All right, unless you're going to walk in stilts into their yard, you're on the ground so you can be within 10 feet of that service ground. All right, we're not telling you can't come into the yard. You can't mow it. What are their fatalities? Number one is saws. Pole saw, seriously, it's metal pole saws that they're running. And number two, they're in a lift, and they're in a lift with a metal pole saw. We're in a lift with a metal cage to it. No dielectric properties. All right, now we're going into the next group here. All right, because yes, those wires are within 10 feet. And in order to be in that tree, you're one of two groups. You're an incidental, meaning you're residential, commercial, or municipal and you have documented training and experience to work near conductors, all right? Or you're going to be doing it on behalf of the utility. Now, to make that point clear, and notice I have proposed, we're working on the 2022 Z standards. And I hope everybody know when I say Z standards, you know what I'm talking about. It's the standards that you have to follow, you shall follow in order to do tree work in the United States. And they're gonna drive this point home for the unqualified by noticing that overhead utility lines include all electrical supply lines, telephone, cable, all communication wires. In other words, just saying any dark line in the sky, you can't be there. But if I'm incidental, sure, I can be in these trees. But how close can I be to the wires now? So let's look at MAD, minimum approach distance. Minimum approach distance is how close you can be to a conductor. So now we're talking the conductor, not the tree. And it's really made up of two parts in the equation. It's what we call the electrical components that flash over. How much of an air gap do I need to make sure it's not going to arc and touch you? That's a big number. And then the other is what we call an oops factor, an ergonomic factor. In other words, you see the wire and then you have to stop, All right? And you add those two together and you get a distance based on the voltage. And it's just not staying away. If it says you have to remain two feet, 10 inches away or three feet away, it's not just how can I contort my body to remain three feet away. It also includes the reasonable reach of your arm in any conductive tool. So that might mean you're actually, your torso is staying six feet away because I've now got to include my arm in the saw that I'm carrying. In other words, be fairly liberal in these. You know, if they say two feet, 10 inches, hey, four sounds better. And I got to add that to my arm. And the way we look at it here is the unqualified 10 feet, the incidental two feet, 10 inches, and the qualified line clearance two feet, two inches. And that's for the lower distribution voltages. I didn't write that table, engineers did, and I don't have much of a problem with it, except I don't like to go by inches because who's going to go up there and say, is that two or three inches? Round up, just round up people. That's all I'm asking. And by the way, your boom, even if it's insulated, has to follow this as well. If you're unqualified and you're working from a boom, that boom can't come within 10 feet of a conductor, any dark line in the sky. 
even if it's insulated. Okay. All right, well, our incident line clearance arbors, as I mentioned here, we got that big group. We're going to be making some changes to them. But right now, I do want to point out this. They can work over a very wide range. And the employer can actually reduce that. The employer can say, yeah, you can work from 0 to 72. Or an employer can say, we're only going to work around service wires and that. There's nothing saying you have to have your crew work higher than that. You can limit it fairly easily if you wish. And what instance occur to them? This is the big one. They touch the saw to the wire. Everybody here has been up trimming in a tree and the tree has a power line running near it and you can safely work in that vicinity, assuming that you can. One of the risks you run is where's that saw gonna go? Now keep in mind, you're incidental. So the point being there is you're probably not doing this every day. So you're not developing that muscle memory you have if you're doing this every day. And remember, if you're doing line clearance, I used to do that. The only reason you're in that tree is there's a wire there. And if you lose sight of the wire, you better freeze because it's there. If you're incidental, might not be a wire one day, might be a wire the next. You have to have that very high situational awareness. Don't lose sight of these. The other, and this is a big one for them, and I mean a real big one for them. What happens is you're up in that tree, you cut a branch, or you're up in a palm and you cut a frond. And the branch comes down, hits the wire, and bumps into you. Boom. The frond hits you. Boom. Or you're holding the branch of the frond. It hits you. Boom. Those are big ones. I mean, kind of the, I don't want to say the interesting point, but when I went through palm fatalities, and you know all of them here, and that, and of course, we all know asphyxiation under the palm skirts, but you know what? You get more electrocuted anything else. We get a lot of power lines running near palms. And palm problems are pretty darn conductive. They should have fried one of those today. Oh, I hate this picture. One of the things that I get to do that's going to have me have a heart attack and die is you hire me and say, hey, John, could you come out and shadow my crew for two days? Take a look at what safety hazards we have. Usually you call me after you've been dinged a couple of times and they say you got to have somebody come in. So I blocked it out. So we're protecting the innocent and they're not in New Mexico or even Texas. What the heck? All right. But what happens is I'm out there and they're taking down a tree and I go, what the? They're tossed zing it around a service drop to pull it out of the way. I love the demonstration. I thank the person who set these two presentations up back to back. That was brilliant. The string burned, didn't it? You get a little moisture on zing it. It's going to fry you. Does it do it every time? No. If it did every time, you wouldn't have to have hot dog demonstrations. You would know, oh, yeah, I've seen about 20 people die this week. I guess I won't do that. But 99 times out of 100, you can do that and live. Do you want to be that one time? No. So don't do this. Took a picture and then screamed at him. And don't be doing this. I, you know what? I, I, I've learned some basic truths over my almost 70 years. One is that when you cut branches in a tree, they never hit the ground. They lodge in the tree. Well, how many here have cut a branch and had it come down and land on a service drop and just kind of twist there? Yeah, it's like that. And how many have taken a climbing line, toss it over the service drop and flick it off? Oh, come on, am I the only one that did that? Apparently, I've got three fatalities last year from people doing that. Three fatalities. Now, some of you, that ought to shock, no pun intended, because if you remember the 1980s, we were taught if someone's in contact with the wire, take a clean, dry rope, throw it over the primer, and pull it away. Don't do that. But notice what they said. Oh, get a little moisture. A little moisture is a little moisture. It's not like it's soaking wet. And they'll conduct electricity. You're not allowed to do that, by the way. That is a violation because your ropes don't meet the standard. And if you're that one that dies, it's going to be a big fine. And hopefully you're going to feel like crap because you just killed somebody and you shouldn't have. Don't be throwing things over these. And the other thing is they reach up and touch it or they're back because, again, they lost where the wire was. Oh, I hate that. It's always a pain. And they didn't do a job briefing, was the other thing, so they didn't know. And the other thing, well, by the way, there's only a few every year, and that doesn't mean they're not tragedy, of course. 
But we do get these with ground workers, and they're doing one of two things there of our incidental. They're working on the truck, you know, like here, just touching up the saw. And the boom, the knuckle of the boom comes in contact with the wire. What have we just done? We've energized the truck, haven't we? Uh, that's what we call touch potential. The other one is, oh, you happen to be just standing next to the truck, and the truck comes energized. All right, and there's a gradient, you know, voltage is a gradient, so there's a difference between the two feet, and that's step potential. Anyone remember our old safety training? I'm going the 80s now, or some of you were born, back when mu music turned to crap, all right? Um, the disco, please. Uh, but anyway, uh, back then we were taught jump on the truck. Stupid, don't ever do that and jump six feet away from the outriggers because that's where it's energized. You know what the new number is? 30 feet. If anyone here can jump 30 feet, you're in the wrong profession. But we've had workers standing on the ground watching the bucket truck there, the bucket truck moves, the knuckle touches the wire, the person on the ground drops dead. Next time someone's only standing 10 feet away. What am I telling you? It doesn't work the same way every time because there's a lot of little variables. Hopefully you remember what they said. Oh yeah, see this could have a little moisture. Oh, this has a little wire to metal to it. All these little variables. So what do you do? You can't know every variable. So don't do this stuff. And what are there is again, their big ones is that cut branch or the saw. Now, we're gonna make a big change for the incidental. As I said, the employer can limit it or can allow more working, but in our new Z, this is proposed, calling them levels rather than the other words, the unqualified. And so the incidental would be a level two arborist, electrically qualified, these are proposed. And in there, we're gonna have a low voltage and a high voltage. So you could say, my crew has training experience and we are level two low voltage. In other words, my crews are qualified to work around service wires, communication wires. That low voltage material that can still kill you but, you know, you, you can work a little closer to it. Or you could say that, no, we have a lot of training and experience, and we're going to work near, not as close as utility workers are, but near the primaries. And guess what? We're changing the distances, too, how close you can work. And we're changing how high you can work. In other words, the level two, the incidental, 35 kV, we're cutting you off. That's the high end of distribution. We're not gonna let you work in the sub transmission anymore. And if you're line clearance, now well, you're working in there all the time. Oops, that one went away, there we go. All right, and what are your fatalities? Interesting enough, cut branch and lift. When I did the research, one thing that I found was interesting, and maybe that's a poor choice of words, if you look, if you're doing line clearance, one of the ways you die is direct contact. Now, here's why. You touch the conductor because the boom was pushed into the wire. Okay? And you end up touching it. You know how this happens? And a little bit of advice to all of you. If you're cutting a long branch here and the wire's here, never be between the two. What happens is they cut a big lead, the lead comes down, hits the boom, everybody's had a branch hit a boom, but a big one hit the boom, takes the boom and pushes it right into the wire momentarily, and they're energized and killed. Never work between what you're cutting and the conductor. That's not a rule, that's a John Ball rule, because that happens a lot. Oh, I like this one. Hey, I used to work for Aspen. Hell, everybody used to work for Aspen. I think we all started there, didn't we? Uh, you worked there once in your life, at, at, at least. Good company, had students go there. So you said, well, I used to work there. I used to do line clearance, so I'm qualified. I'm working residential now, I'm still qualified. No, you're not. You were qualified. Here's the crazy thing. I've worked for companies where we did residential and we had small contracts to do utility. Sometimes for a week, you might be doing utility uh, for a co-op. The next week, you might be doing residential. Even though you're the same person with the same training, you have one rule when you're doing line clearance, 
you have other rules when you're doing residential. Does everybody get that? The rules follow the work, not the individual. And the only way you can be lying, Clarence, all right, is that you're working on behalf of the utility. I can trace your paycheck back to the utility there. By the way, they have a very low rate of electrical contacts. Why? They train all the time. I mean, one nice thing about working for some of the big line clearance companies, you are going to get trained a lot. And you're working around it all the time. So you're going to do it pretty safe. Like I said, you don't want to be electrocuted, go do line clearance. Uh, moderate rate is actually the other end, the public and the unqualified. Why? A lot of them know, hmm, that doesn't look safe. I'll stay away from it. The group I worry about the most is probably sitting in this room. It's the residential commercial. You're out there working around a conductor, nothing's ever happened, so you figure nothing ever will happen, and something does. So be safe around there. And then here's the new proposal. I've got just uh, two or three slides on this, and then I'll stop, finish on time, always do. And that is, we are now writing a standard for these FR towers. You familiar with these? You look around, you'll find these little towers. They're on my campus. We got eight of them. They're right up in the canopy of the tree. They're about 30 feet. They're the little towers that they have that are beaming the signals. In fact, I think I'll end on this slide. This will be a good one to slide. I was just going to show you two more pictures of it. But that's not ionizing radiation. That's closer to your microwave. Here's the problem. Now, by the way, if you're walking on the ground, don't worry about it. But if you're up there trimming, now you're around that beam. And there's been a couple of good articles. And here's the thing you don't want. When your arm feels hot, it's too late. You're cooking from the inside. Now, I don't want to freak you out. You can walk down around these cell towers and that. But these little cell towers, and they're hard to see because they look like street poles until you look close to them and you see all the things up there. The rules are saying, well, do we say six feet away? Do we see 10 feet away? Some of the cell providers are asking for 25 or 30 feet away. Right now, we don't have a standard for it for tree workers. It's not in our Z. That'll be in the new Z. But I just want to make you aware of the risk. I don't want to make you frightened, but just knowledgeable that if you see one of these up in the sky around your tree and you see a couple of fried squirrels, maybe not a good day to be there. I'm kidding about the squirrels. Maybe a fried cat. That would be fine. All right. So I uh, got to end on time here. I'm around all today. Got another chance to chat with you. And I'm around tomorrow like Gary. So at that point, I can take questions this afternoon. I apologize, but we had to get back on schedule. So Brian or whoever, I'll turn it over to you. And we'll, you can get our next speaker started. So thank you, people. Join being here. Thanks very much, Dr. Ball. And if we could just take a few minutes and we can finish up with the tree limb. I don't want you guys to miss out on that, but really appreciate uh, all the information. If you guys have any questions at all, feel free to get with uh, Dr. Ball or any of these guys up here.